Welcome. Uh, the grounding of the Ever Given has been much talked about over recent weeks. Uh, first for the incident itself and, and second for the current detention of the vessel by the Egyptian authorities. The impact of the grounding, both on its own and in combination with the current pandemic uh, and the aftermath of Brexit, has brought into sharp focus just how easy it is to cause disruption to the global supply chain. To the global supply chain. And now, there are, of course, divergent views as to just how much disruption will flow from the grounding. Uh, clearing the backlog once the canal re reopened is said to have taken less than a week, while other traffic diverted around Good Hope. Uh, but there are still reports that the incident will encourage companies to diversify their suppliers, bulk up infantries, and re rely less on just-in-time strategies. Certainly, Maersk's chief economist is reported in the Financial Times. Uh, for, having, for saying that it is remarkable how supply chains have held up over the last 12 months, but the shipping executives must soon decide whether so-called black swan events um, are one in 100 years or one in 20 year phenomena and adapt their strategies accordingly. It's with this in mind that over two of our quadcast shipping specials, myself and other experienced practitioners uh, from Quadrant Chambers will be analyzing the potential legal impact of an incident like the ever given grounding and considering the issues which arise and some of the solutions. I should perhaps emphasize that while the ever given grounding provides the context for our discussions, the issues we're going to consider are not specific to that incident and we're certainly not important to give advice on any particular issues arising from that, from the grounding. Uh, so I'm Nigel Cooper. Uh, I'm joined today by James Turner QC, Shirag Kari QC, uh, and Ruth Hosky. Uh, biographies are available for all of us on Chambers' website and with the invitations that you receive to this event. Suffice it to say for now that between us, we have a wealth of experience in wet and dry shipping uh, and marine insurance, and, and that all of us have significant experience of litigating and advising on liability for and the consequences of collisions and groundings. In today's session, uh, we'll be looking at the immediate aftermath of the grounding uh, and, and the position as between owners and charterers. The wider legal implications will be addressed in our second session, and I'll say more about that later. Uh, now, we have had a few questions already, uh, but if you do want to ask a question, please put it in the chat function and we'll come back to it at the end. Um, now, I've sort of set the initial scene, but, but, but clearly the wider commercial aspects of, the, of, of a grounding do require a little bit more thought. Um. Yes, thank you, Nigel. Now, as everyone will know, the Suez Canal is one of the key trade arteries in world trade. Um, whether what happened with the Ever Given was a heart attack or merely a hiccup, um, it can be a matter of debate. But one thing is for sure that about 12% or one eighth of the world's trade goes through the Suez Canal. And for at least six days, that was stopped. That is a major impact on uh, the operation and efficient operation of world trade. Now, it's true that some of the vessels would have diverted uh, around the Cape, but it nevertheless led to a considerable delay and indeed additional expense. Now, as we know, the grounding itself lasted for six days. And as Nigel has pointed out, uh, the clear up thereafter, i.e clearing out the backlog lasted for something less than a further week. But because we have supply chains that operate on just-in-time basis, there will inevitably have been a considerable disruption down the line. And indeed, of course, the um, people waiting for the cargo on the Ever Given itself are still waiting and indeed could be waiting for a considerable amount of time. Now, 400 vessels were trapped on either side of the Ever Given. And as a result of the grounding, there was a spike in freight rates and also a spike in oil um, rates as well, uh, although that did come down after the uh, grounding was cleared and the vessel was moved into the Great Bitter Lakes. Um, the industries that were affected, and this, this will become clearer as, uh, uh, as matters progress, um, were in particular those that were already suffering from certain shortages. So semiconductors is one, uh, one area where we know there are pre-existing shortages and you may have read in the paper recently about Jaguar stopping production for lack of semiconductors. 
And therefore, where you have delay or blockages, um, that will inevitably and did lead to further disruption. Egypt itself, uh, it's, it is estimated lost about $15 million in transit fees. And there is also a pre-existing shortage and uh, misallocation of containers. Uh, and we could have seen this in the problems that we have been experienced in Californian ports. And that will undoubtedly have been exacerbated by the delay and hold up. Uh, so that's, that's the general commercial context. Now, James, uh, by reference to some charts we worked on in the case that uh, we represented different parties as did Ruth and being led by Rob Thomas, uh, is going to show us about how the, the particular area within the Suez Canal that was affected. James. Thank you, Shirag. Uh, yes, as, as Shirag has mentioned, um, he, Ruth and I, uh, and Ruth and Rob Thomas, uh, were involved in the, the last collision action tried by Mr. Justice Tier, um, which was in this very stretch of the canal. Uh, now, the um, you can see, I hope, on your screens uh, a picture of the chart. Uh, the Ever Given went to ground roughly uh, in way of the kilometer 151 marker. Uh, and just draw some of your attention to a few features um, of um, the, um, that area. The first, which you can't see from the chart itself, is that there is a strong uh, north-south current of between two and three knots. Uh, the, the second is that just north of the 151 marker are some underwater cables or pipelines uh, with some more the other side of the kilometer 150 marker. Uh, the, the, the next is that the width of the canal is limited. Uh, this vessel was a, 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 the, the biggest size container ship that is allowed to go through um, the Suez Canal without special permission. Um, and she was drawing a great deal of water. She was heavily laden. And uh, the result of that, of course, is that the underkeel clearance uh, is not very great uh, and becomes less still as soon as uh, she puts on any power. Um, and if you've seen any of the AIS reconstructions that are floating about on YouTube, uh, you will have seen that the ship is was apparently going as, as fast as 13 knots over the ground. Once you take into account the current, that means she was doing anything up to 16 knots through the water, uh, which is quite fast. Uh, and the what appears to have happened, whether it was caused by wind uh, or something else, uh, doesn't matter and we can't know at the moment anyway, uh, is that her stern got, um, perhaps as a result of oversteer, who knows, um, quite close to the west bank of the canal uh, and as a result of the very considerable hydrodynamic forces generated by a vessel of this size traveling at that speed was sucked into uh, the canal bank. Uh, and then you see the, the vessel almost skid um, and then uh, come to uh, an abrupt stop with her nose uh, buried in the, uh, in the desert. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, Ruth, what does, a, what does a ship owner do? Well, yes, if you're the owner of a ship and you've got a vessel stuck in a canal, whether it's grounded or whether it's as a result of the collision, what are your options? There are three main options to consider. The first is local salvage. Uh, the second is an LOF with or without scopic. And the third is um, some form of BIMCO contract, whether it's rec hire or one of the other ones. Now, just having a look at those in turn, um, there are a number of tugs stationed at Suez. Some of them are pretty hefty. Um, depending on the severity of your grounding or your collision, they might be able to assist, particularly if you think it's going to be a relatively simple tug and tow, not requiring any extraction um, from the side of the bank. Um, they're likely to seek remuneration under local law, so something like the equivalent of our common law of salvage. Uh, and no doubt you've all seen in the press reports that certainly at the moment the Suez Canal authorities appear to be seeking a $300 million salvage bonus. Um, in, in respect of what their vessels did. Um, I think going forward for, for um, owners that use the sewers a lot, it might be very sensible to get some local law advice in advance of an accident happening to know what the rights and wrongs are of any common, a, a similar common law salvage claim would be so that you sort of know what your options might be. Um, 
So that's local salvage. The, the main likelihood is that an LOF might get um, signed. As we all know, that's no cure, no pay. Um, salved cargo will have to contribute to the salvage award ultimately, so that's not something that just falls on an owner's shoulders. Um, cargo interests and salvors have to provide security on redelivery. Um, and a vessel containing a large amount of cargo, such as the Ever Given or a similar container ship, um, that's going to be an immense undertaking and quite often um, cause organisational difficulties and lead to quite a lot of delay. Um, one thing to think about with your LOF contractor is whether they want to hire in or contract with the local tugs to try and stop um, a separate salvage claim being made by the authorities after the event. It, I mean, if you have an LOF, if you've entered into an LOF, the, the question you need to ask is whether you want to incorporate Scopic or not. Uh, as we all know, Scopic is invoked at the behest of the contractors only. And on doing so, they'll, you as an owner will have to provide initial security and then further security down the line. Um, it's worth considering Clause 9 of Scopic prevents termination of services if the authorities do not allow salvos to demobilise. And that's quite an important factor to consider in a case, particularly something like this in the sewers, where the authorities are going to be heavily involved uh, and it might result in an escalation of costs for owners. So think very carefully about whether you want a Scopic incorporation or not. And um, if you don't go down an LOF route, your option really are the BIMCO contract. So there's REC hire, REC stage and REC fixed. Uh, they're all stated to represent fairly the interests of both parties. But as we all know, REC hire is more salvo friendly. REC fixed is the most ship owner friendly and unsurprisingly REC stage sits somewhere in the middle. Um, importantly, REC hire costs are essentially borne entirely by owners. And so that's something that needs to be considered uh, when you're considering as an owner what you want to do. Although an owner might be able to get some recovery through GA, but um, I think we're going to have a little debate later about whether uh, just because it's a danger under salvage, it might be an imminent peril under a GA event. Now, James, I think you might have um, some comments, I think, in relation to the practicalities of salvage in the Suez Canal. Uh, yes, well, in a, in a situation like this, there are three um, salvage aspects which the contractor, if, there, if indeed there is a contractor, will have to bear in mind. The first is the um, possibility that um, anything it might do might make matters worse. Uh, and it is common to see professional salvors employ salvage naval architects to ensure that the stresses that they're putting on the ship for example, by moving cargo or shifting bunkers or um, ballast um, it is within the strength of the hull um, to manage. The, the second, going back to my chart, if you remember it, is uh, that if, if it had come to lightering or if in a similar casualty it came to lightering the cargo, you're going to need a very large crane indeed to reach the top of the container stacks. Uh, and a crane of that size uh, is almost certainly going to need to be anchored in position uh, with, a, with an anchor spread. Uh, and obviously the salvor would have to be very careful not to damage underwater cables, cables and pipelines um, with, with the uh, anchors. The third, and this is perhaps the most topical, is that uh, it is absolutely key for the salvor to liaise closely with uh, the local authorities. Um, it's essential, particularly where the, the world's media uh, have a light shining uh, brightly at the local authorities, that the Salvor communicate uh, what they're doing, why they're doing it, how long it's going to take, what the prospects of success are, what the next steps will be uh, if they don't work. Um, and we can see the importance of that in the Ever Given Casualty, because uh, once the vessel was refloated and towed up to the Great Bitter Lake, um, it became apparent that the, the local authorities had had a very serious sense of humour failure over the whole episode uh, with the, the seizure that we are now um, all familiar with. Um, and the, this is important um, for a, a legal reason as well, not just a technical one. Um, although under the, um, the BIMCO um, contracts, it is likely that a specific place for redelivery will be agreed in the um, the, the uh, boxes at the front of the, the salvage agreement. Uh, that's not necessarily the case, although it can be an LOF and is, and is not the case in a, uh, a common law uh, salvage at all. Um, in order to claim a salvage reward under the salvage convention, under Article 13, 
the cell wall must achieve a useful result. Uh, and query here whether a useful result was achieved. Um, now, the uh, and that may require analysis in due course as to whether there was one peril here, namely grounding or immobilized until professionally assisted, um, or, or two, namely the prospect of seizure by the, the local authorities. Um, put another way, um, it is settled law that if a, a ship, for example, is refloated and is then uh, damaged as a result of intervening negligence in an ensuing collision, the salvor is still entitled to a salvage reward for the state of the casualty as at the time of refloating. But the position may be different where the salvor uh, effectively takes the casualty out of the frying pan and lays it in the fire. Uh, and there may be some um, difficult issues ahead so far as that's concerned. Um, but the um, more interesting question, perhaps uh, immediately, um, Sherag, is whether the claim for salvage under one of the BIMCO um, contracts can form the subject of a general average claim. Yes, James. Um, and in fact, there are at least five um, very important questions that arise in relation to GA. Um, firstly, whether there is a GA event or G events, what falls within the scope of GA, which is the question that you've raised, James, with regard to salvage, what the procedure for getting an uh, GA securities is, the effective incorporation of charter party terms and jurisdictional issues. Um, as regards whether salvage falls within GA, it depends which, um, t which uh, year of the York Antwerp rules has been incorporated. If it's 2004 um, and 2000, so if it's 2000, 1994 and 2016, then you're fine. But if it's 2004, then salvage does not fall within GA. So, the, but the prior question is, is there a GA event or not? And uh, Nigel, I mean, the first question has to be is whether the grounding was itself a GA event in the sense that was the vessel in peril? or the cargo in peril. Well, <clears throat> that, that, that's quite right, Shirag. And as, as we probably again all know, that for there to be a G GA event, there has to be a threat to the common safety of both ship and cargo. And, and clearly the question that will arise in connection with the grounding, uh, and indeed the subsequent detention or seizure is of, of, a, of a vessel, is, is whether at any point there is a peril to the ship or to the cargo of a sufficient magnitude to justify the associated expenditure being considered extraordinary. Now, if there is then such a peril, uh, it's a separate question wh whether there is a threat to both interests or whether it is only the ship which is at risk. Certainly in the context of a grounding, it may be easier to say that the need for refloating to, to release the vessel is a sufficient step to give rise to um, a peril for the purposes of GA. Um, if, on the other hand, the only likely consequence for car of a grounding for cargo is delay, uh, and that cargo will not actually cause damage, sorry, that delay will not actually cause damage to the cargo, then there may be a good case that there's no peril to the common marine maritime adventure, uh, and therefore no general average event. Now, of course, the, the particular facts of the ever given are unusual, but they do allow us to hypothesize as to to what happens where you have a grounding followed by either a detention or seizure, um, either by local or, or, or national authorities. Um, and, and the question of whether or not that gives rise to one or two general average events, namely the initial grounding uh, and, and, and the subsequent detention of the vessel. Now, it may well be said that in circumstances where it is reasonable to regard the subsequent detention of the ship as flowing from uh, steps taken by the owners or by salvors to, to resolve the consequences of the grounding, uh, that, that, that there is no separate peril, no subsequent break in the chain of causation. However, where the detention arises for unusual facts or, or from extraordinary demands, then I can see a case where that, that makes the detention um, a separate general average event. It, it's probably worth emphasizing that, that despite the sums being claimed for in relation in the present case, in, in, in relation to the ever given, that the detention there does follow a process of judicial arrest and is being litigated through the Egyptian courts. 
Um, and, and, and clearly that, that factor may well play or in, almost inevitably will play in, 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 into the question of what GA consequences the detention has. But, but if there was a detention where it was going to be easier to say that that detention was unlawful, uh, made by an authority in support of extraordinary demands, um, whether for salvage or, or indeed damages claims, um, then there may be an analogy to the situation with the cases concerning ransoms to pirates. Um, most recently, for example, the Longchamp or the Governor case, where um, both the ransoms and the time spent negotiating the ransoms uh, have been held to constitute uh, legitimate GA expenditure, although query then which event that expenditure relates to. Um, and what I suspect that this is all going to mean is, is as is very often the case, um, what is important uh, after the event is, is the wordings used in the various documents intended to secure owners and indeed cargo's position in relation to uh, GA contribution. Um, now, I know that certainly you, Shirag, and I think you, Ruth, have both done cases regarding those wordings and indeed the ordinary procedures. So, so yes. what, what do we need to know? Well, um, certainly in the case I was involved in called the Lehman Timber in the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal emphasized the 200-year-old practice of requiring cargo owners to give both a general average guarantee, which is security usually from the cargo's insurer, but if, they, if the cargo is uninsured, then other... Um, adequate security has to be found, and a GA bond under which the uh, recipient, the receiver, acknowledges liability to the extent there is any liability to contribute towards GA. Uh, the reason for that being is at common law, the liability to pay GA uh, uh, arises on the owner of the cargo at the time the GA event occurs, which may not necessarily be the receiver. There are a number of standard terms out there. And uh, usually those documents, as long as the uh, shippers and their insurers have been careful, um, will enable the cargo interests to challenge whether there is a GA event at all, as well as challenging the GA adjustment and the quantum that is being demanded of them. So th that is the ordinary procedure um, for GA. Um, there's also obviously the issue of jurisdiction. Uh, we don't know precisely what jurisdictional provisions are set out in the bills of lading, but if you search on the web, you will find a standard evergreen bill of lading. And if that was used, then that provides for the jurisdiction of the English High Court, albeit it has a carve out in favor of the owners to be able to proceed against any merchants at anywhere that has competent jurisdiction. Um, there's also some issues, uh, Nigel, about the incorporation of charter party wording into bills of lading. Perhaps you may want to discuss that. Yeah, I, I, I will. I will come to that. I was just going to ask Ruth, though, just in terms of because I think you were involved in the BSLE Sunrise, weren't you? That and that gives us some help on um, the question of primacy of guarantees and, and, and when contribution is due. Yes, yeah, so the, the BSLE Sunrise was a preliminary issue case that looked at the standard form of wording in a, in a Lloyd's guarantee for general average. Um, and it looked at what was meant by properly due. So i.e. if as a cargo claimant, um, you say that there's a rule D defence under the York Antwerp rules, or, or I suppose if you say that there wasn't a general average event in any event, then no amounts are due under the guarantee until such time as those have been litigated. Whilst the case wasn't specifically about the interim payment provision, it seems to me that the same um, result is likely to arise because it uses similar language. And I think that's important because I think owners have always felt that the interim payment provision was essentially a pay now, argue later clause so that you can recover some of your GA early and then have an argument later about whether a rule D defense or, or indeed an argument about whether there was a general average event uh, in any event happening later. Um, I don't think that that is how the courts will treat them in light of the BSLE Sunrise. And so if as an owner, you really want to have that as your possibility, you are going to have to amend the standard wording of the Lloyd's um, form of GA guarantee. Um, and it's also worth saying, you are sort of at the behest of the cargo interest who could 
raise a rule D defence or say that there wasn't a general average event, irrespective of how um, legitimate or meritorious that ultimately will be. I think the other thing to bear in mind um, or in other cases, or, and possibly in this case too, is what sort of form of words are on the back of the bill. Certainly if you've got a congen bill form, there's a clause that says cargo's contribution in GA shall be paid to the carrier even when such average is due as a result of the failure neglect error of, error of the part master pilot or crew. Um, that is an issue that will be litigated later this year, but certainly the authors of Lowndes and Rudolph suggest that that's a legitimate provision to have in it, that it doesn't fall foul of anything within the Hague rules itself. And so that's something I think um, owners also might want to consider in an incident a bit like this one. So yeah, I mean, again, that, that just seems to highlight the importance of, of looking at the wordings of the bills. And, and, and certainly there was a recent case, Her Herculito Maritime and Gunbook, that emphasise the importance of looking at uh, of, of possible incorporation wordings uh, in bills of lading, and, and indeed the different position that owners and charterers might have uh, as between, uh, sorry, owners might have in terms of recovering GA contribution from owner from charterers or indeed from cargo interests. And, and the issue in that case, uh, which I think might well arise in many cases, is that um, the relevant charter party contained clauses regarding the need for war risks insurance uh, and the responsibility of charterers to pay for that cover. Uh, it was held that as between owners and charterers, those provisions provided a complete code uh, for, for insurance of, event, uh, uh, of, the, of the relevant events and, and, and indeed covered also uh, liability for GA contributions uh, in that particular case in respect of ransom payments. Uh, and therefore owners had no right to recover GA contribution under the charter party terms. Um, but, equal, but, but cargo interests then sought to say, well, those same provisions were incorporated into the bill of lading uh, and, and therefore cargo interests were also protected by the complete insurance code. Uh, and, and in relation to that, uh, the, court, the court held that no, that wasn't right. Uh, because although, the, although generally the, there were words of incorporation on the bill of lading, uh, you still had to look at the relevant charge party clauses and see whether you can manipulate the wording uh, to make them fit within the bill of lading contract. Uh, and they held that in that, con and the court held that you couldn't, um, and, and that therefore owners' right to look to cargo interests to recover their GA contributions was still preserved. Um, but James, I think you had an interesting comment earlier about um, the difference between peril for the purposes of GA and uh, danger for the purposes of salvage. Uh, well, yes, this is um, something which I think Mr. Justice Tier hoped he'd lay to rest in a case called the Cape Bonnie, where he expressed uh, fairly extreme skepticism that there could be a different test between the two. But I, I think that that was um, the cri de coeur of a very experienced salvage practitioner who had, after all, been the Lloyd's Appeal arbitrator for some years. Um, I think uh, possibly not considering uh, that there is a distinction between a danger in salvage terms to the, um, the fund, as it's called, um, which can be a relatively minor thing, such as a, a temporary immobilization requiring assistance uh, and a peril to the maritime adventure as a whole. Uh, and there, although he expressed um, that skepticism in the Cape Bonnie, I think the better view has to be, and certainly uh, e even the addition of Lowndes and Rudolph that followed the Cape Bonnie uh, expresses the view that uh, the, the two remain um, distinct. Uh, and there are cases, um, there's certainly one case on its facts, where there was quite an extreme grounding, uh, where the judge held nevertheless uh, the cargo was never in any danger, uh, uh, and therefore there was no GA uh, event at all. Um, but that uh, brings us uh, really uh, to the question of uh, liabilities as between owners and charterers, Ruth. Yeah, so in this session, we're considering the liabilities between owners and charterers. The session next week, which Nigel will talk about later in more detail, considers third party claims. 
So lots of different issues may arise depending on where you are or, or which owner or charter you're talking about. So there might be a demise or bareboat charter in your case or a time charter or a voyage charter or a slot charter. The core theme though is always going to be does a particular risk lie? Does it lie with the owner or the charter under that contractual regime? And it's also worth considering, um, in brief at least, that the position um, under a number of charters in terms of grounding in particular may also result in an unsafe port claim. So uh, unlikely in this particular incident probably, but in other cases it might arise. Now, trying to deal with the, the chain of charters in, in some sort of logical fashion. James, what about a bear con, if you've got a bear con or a demise charter? Well, if there's a bear con or a demise charter, there are, there are two clauses in particular that are likely to be relevant. The first is that there is a no lien provision uh, in bear con. Um, obviously, salvage, um, a successful salvage, creates a lien, um, a maritime lien, which will survive transfer of ownership. Uh, and the, um, it's strongly arguable that the, the bareboat charter would be obliged to ha have that lien effectively removed, probably by furnishing security. The, the other um, material provision is that the, the owner um, might be thought liable to contribute in GA in respect of the benefit made by the GA expenditure or sacrifice uh, to its reversionary interest in the ship. Um, but there is an express provision in Bearcon that the owner is not to contribute uh, in GA. And moving, moving on from Bearcon, of course, there is the, the time charter and it's, it's um, been reported in Lloyd's list at least that the time charterers um, Evergreen have arrested, have issued, a, not have arrested, have issued an in rem claim form against the vessel's owner um, in London. Um, now, that, uh, how that will interface with limitation, we can come to discuss in due course. Um, but the interesting question um, to deal with in passing here is how that would work if there's an arbitration clause in the Charter Party, which seems quite likely. And the answer to that is that uh, under the Arbitration Act, it is possible to issue uh, an in-rem claim form, arrest the ship and obtain security, and for that security then to stand for the result in the, uh, in the arbitration with the in-rem claim then being stayed. So that's a, a, a perfectly um, standard way of proceeding. Um, but what about what are the claims that the uh, time charterer might bring, Shirag? Well, um, they really fall into two grounds. I mean, the, the off-hire issues, and then there are claims for breach of contract, breach of charter. As far as the off-hire clause is concerned, I think, again, we need to look at, at two different incidents. There is the grounding, and then there is the subsequent arrest or detention of the vessel uh, that is presently ongoing. As regards the grounding, if we have the standard NYPE form, then clause 15 lists grounding as one of the off-hire events. And so then that's a pretty um, open and shut case. This is a grounding, the vessel is off-hire for all time, all time uh, resulting, all loss of time resulting. Um, it gets a lot more complicated when you come to arrests and detention, um, because in cases like the Laconian Confidence and the Saldana, the courts have generally held that where you have an unamended clause 15, then arrests and detentions not related to the perceived or actual condition of the vessel or her trading history will not be off fire events. On the other hand, if the word whatsoever has been added, which it sometimes is, to clause 15, um, then it will be covered and will be an off fire event. Um, quite apart from that, and off-hire is quite separate. It just has a mechanical operation of when hire stops and starts. We have a claim for breach of charter. Now, generally, under the NYP in most charter parties, the uh, charterers would have to prove unseaworthiness and that the uh, loss of time led to unseaworthiness so that they could reclaim whatever hire that they had been forced to pay because the vessel wasn't off-hire and indeed any other damages that they may well have. So that leads to questions about uh, cargo claims and how those are uh, dealt with as between owners and charterers. We aren't going to talk about the cargo claims themselves. And Nigel, I think you were going to say a few things about the interclub agreement. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, sure. As you said, outside the question of off hire, the, the relevant claims that are going to be look, uh, probably passing up and down the, the chain of the charter part, uh, sorry, between owners and charters, uh, are likely to be claims um, predominantly in respect of indemnities, in respect of cargo claims uh, brought by cargo interests, in respect of any contribution to GA, or indeed for delay or damage to the cargo. Now, of course, so far as whether charters that will have any liabilities in the context of a grounding in respect of cargo claims uh, is inevitably going to depend on the nature of the bills issued um, and, and indeed the uh, relationship, the contractual relationship with subcharters, uh, and, and in the context of container shipping, the, the relationship with slot charters. But but certainly, uh, in, uh, certainly in the context of containerized containerized cargo, one can well envisage that there may be a chain of bill of ladings that have to be considered as some of which will be um, contractual carriers bills, charterers bills. Um, now, as to the nature of the, 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 the claims that might be brought for breach of charter, um, in a typical time charter scenario, uh, there may well be claims put on the break basis of the breach of, uh, of the obligation of utmost dispatch. Um, of course, another alternative where there's a clause paramount incorporated in the bills and in the time charters. Um, will be claims under the Hague rules uh, and indeed the Hague Visby rules. Uh, now it's fairly stat common, occasionally in, in charter parties you see exceptions or in standard form charters you see exceptions for errors of navigation. Um, now those won't protect an owner against liability for negligent nav navigation. Um, of course, if the Hague rules or the Hague Visby rules are incorporated, uh, then the owners are likely to rely on Article 4.2 exception for negligent navigation. Um, and of course, depending on the circumstances of the grounding, uh, that could then well lead into questions whether or not uh, the vessel was unseaworthy at the commencement of the voyage, either because of incompetent crew uh, or indeed uh, because of inadequate passage planning, a, a topic that, as we all know, will be considered by the Supreme Court later in the year. Um, and of course, there's the other alternative that quite often one sees arising out of groundings, which is the scenario where the owner, sorry, charterers allege negligent navigation, but then owners come back in, depending on the place of the grounding, um, with an allegation of unsafe port. Um, positioning in relation to cargo claims may, however, be even more nuanced in the sense that very often, certainly under time charters, uh, cargo claims are going to be subject to the interclub agreement, or there's an agreement that cargo claims will be apportioned uh, in accordance with the interclub agreement. Um, and if that's the case, then there are certainly a number of issues that need to be considered. The first, and, and, and I make this as a preliminary point, but it is an important one, is that the interclub agreement regime is independent of any liability regime in the charter. It's intended to provide for a mechanistic pro process of apportionment, or, although given the number of authorities on its construction, there may be a question as whether the interclub agreement is as simple as people or as it is intended to be. Um, more fundamentally, cargo responsibility clauses must not have been materially altered, uh, and any claims for which an owner or charterer seeks recovery under the interclub agreement must be one that is authorised under the charter party, uh, and... Uh, Carry, and the cargo must have been carried on terms that are no less favourable than the Hague rules and the Hague Visby rules. Finally, and this, this is the one that sometimes causes some, some questions and confusion in terms of the preliminaries, um, the relevant cargo claims need to have been properly settled or compromised and paid. Um, and, and certainly there, there is off, quite often an argument that uh, uh, there is no cause of, our, of action has arisen under the interclub agreement or certainly on the face of it, no cause of action arises until the cargo claims have in fact been paid. And, and therefore, very often when one's pleading an interclub ca uh, case, one will be putting in the backup of an indemnity in relation to those claims once they have been settled. Um, there is, of course, the separate two-year time bar for interclub agreement, for uh, apportionment under the interclub agreement. And it's important to make sure that claims are notified uh, in accordance with its provisions. Uh, and then it is finally worth making the point that certainly under the latest version of the interclub agreement, uh, it does cover claim, uh, the agreement does cover claims for delay by cargo. Um, now, that those, those are the preliminaries in terms of apportionment. 
uh, where you have a grounding, it's quite quite likely, almost inevitable, I would have thought, that the charterers are going to be saying uh, that the claims arise out of um, error of, or fault in navigation, uh, or indeed unseaworthiness, and therefore, therefore, the owners. Um, the only other possibility, and this may become pertinent if we're looking at two events rather than one, is that where you've got cargo damage that can be attributed solely to the detention, um, is that you might then be looking at apportionment under uh, clause eight, paragraph 8D of the interclub agreement, um, which on the, provides for a, a default 50-50 split, um, unless there's clear and irrefutable evidence that the claims arise out of the act or neglect of one of the parties, uh, in which case th that party then bears 100%. Um, now, this is the question of how cargo claims and other claims are going to be dealt with in, in principle. But, but of course, as we've already mentioned, a, a, limitation fund, a limitation action has been commenced, I think, in the case of the Ever Given, and, and, and that's a relatively standard step. So, so we do need to look at the, how limitation plays in, don't we, Ruth? Well, certainly. I mean, if you're if you're the owner, or and importantly, the owner's P and I club, um, and you're potentially facing an awful lot of claims. Uh, by charterers and or uh, cargo claimants, you'll want to consider your position under the convention and the possibility of setting up a limitation fund somewhere. Um, it strikes me that there's a, an initial question um, in relation to limitation, which has also been raised by the panelists in relation to general average, and that's whether there's a single maritime incident or two, because the limitation fund is in relation to a single maritime incident. So you might find arguments about whether there's been more than one incident. Um, Obviously, there are some jurisdictional questions which we'll come on to in a minute um, about where your limitation fund is set up and how it protects you. But what sort of fund are we talking about, Nigel, if we're looking at a containerized ship of this sort of size? I think we're, we're, we're looking at a fund, I, I believe that the fund in this case, is in, in the case of the Ever Given, it's said to be about 114 million. Um, and, and that gives you the idea of the sort of scale of fund that will be generated where you have claims against these, these very large vessels. And then it, it, what about that the fund obviously will be set up by the owners, but who else will it protect? Well, um, the, the, the first point is, to, it, 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 there's two points to make in relation to that. The first is that um, if claims are being advanced against charterers or slot charterers, um, they expressly, well, charterers expressly falls within the definition of ship owner for the purposes of Article 1-2. Uh, and certainly in the MSC Napoli, it's, I think that's pretty much determined now that slot charterers take the protection as well. Um, of course, where they won't get protection is if there are claims by owners against charterers for damage to the vessel. That, that is not, not, not covered. Um, in the context of a case where you have claims brought by harbour authorities, um, in respect, for example, for damage to harbour works, basins and waterways, uh, that will be protected uh, by the limitation fund, assuming, of course, that um, in principle, the harbour authority are prepared to look to the fund ra rather than take steps within their own jurisdiction. Um, given the amount we've been talking about salvage and GA, we, we should make clear that uh, a, a limitation fund doesn't protect owners in respect of direct claims. Uh, for salvage uh, or GA contribution, uh, but it does extend to cover claims for a contribution or indemnity in respect of either salvage or GA contribution. Uh, but, but of course, this all depends on, on the effectiveness of the fund and, and where it's set up, doesn't it, Ruth? Yeah, so the, essentially um, states fall into four categories. There are states that have signed up to the 1957 convention. There are states that have signed up to the 76 convention. There are states like the UK that signed up to the 96 protocol. Um, and technically you're supposed to denounce the 76 convention if you signed the 96 protocol. And then of course there are states that have signed up to nothing. Um, I'm sure the panelists will correct me if they think I'm wrong, but in my view, if you set up a fund in a 96 protocol country, like um, at setting up a fund in London, it doesn't protect you uh, against action being taken in 57 convention, 76 convention or, or no convention countries. Um, similarly, if you set up a fund in a 76 convention country, it won't protect you against um, action being taken in, for example, a 57 convention. 
So there are lots of, um, it's important to bear in mind what you're actually managing to do by setting up a limitation fund. Um, London is obviously quite a popular place to set up funds. Um, James, are there practical reasons why it might be sensible to choose London? Well, the, the, the overwhelmingly uh, sensible reason to choose London um, is that the because we're signatories to the 96 protocol, the fund here is as large as a limitation fund can get. Uh, and there is not much point in um, trying for uh, anything in a 76 convention country because you won't get as much limitation. There might be point in a 57 convention country uh, where the facts allow it because it's much easier to break limit uh, in a 57 uh, under the 57 convention. But the real, although there aren't many signatories to the 96 protocol, the real uh, draw um, of um, the fund for claimants is that the fund will be very large, um, uh, uh, as large as I say as you're going to get. Um, uh, under uh, any limitation convention. Uh, and that, that will be the hope of the owner and the PNI club that they will um, attract claims to London and against that fund and so not have to deal with claims uh, all the way around the world um, in whatever jurisdiction can take, um, can entertain a, a each individual claim. And talking of jurisdiction, Shirag, are there any particular jurisdictional hurdles that have to be got over to, to set up your fund here? Um, yes, well, certainly as far as the English court is concerned, one needs to think of jurisdiction in two different senses. The first one is subject matter jurisdiction. Can the court adjudicate this type of dispute? And the second is personal jurisdiction. Does the court have jurisdiction over this particular defendant? Uh, can it serve on this defendant either because it's within the jurisdiction or one of the grounds for serving out uh, apply? Now, in the ICL Vikraman, Mr. Justice Coleman held that for purposes of Article 11 of the Limitation Convention, that is where you set up the fund, uh, there had to be a pre-existing claim um, against the, uh, uh, the owner. Um, that was... I, I think it's fair to say doubted in the Western region, although not overruled, because in that case, what the court held is that the limitation convention does not set any uh, subject matter jurisdiction limits. And the real question is, can the claimant, usually the ship owner, um, serve out on the defendant or establish jurisdiction by virtue of the defendant being within the jurisdiction? Now, uh, if, for example, uh, the bills of lading apply, uh, require uh, that English law applies or that London arbitration or provide for English high court jurisdiction, obviously, um, then there would be grounds to serve out on those bill of lading holders. And essentially what you would do is you would get one uh, anchor defendant and then you would seek to limit uh, against the whole world. Um, based upon that anchor defendant. Now, there's also some issues or wrinkles with regard to wreck removal, James, isn't there, aren't there? Uh, well, there are, and this is really a, a footnote to our discussions. Obviously, it doesn't arise in the ever given uh, casualty. Uh, but uh, the 76 Convention makes provision for um, uh, claims for wreck removal to be the subject of limitation, but it gave the contracting states the right to signal that they might opt out of that. Uh, and the UK was one of the states that signaled that it might opt out of um, limiting rec removal claims. Uh, but there is a debate as to whether it succeeded in doing so, because the way in which the, um, the opt out is or is not uh, given effect to in the Merchant Shipping Act is a bit of a dog's breakfast. And there is, as I say, a debate, which was not going to be resolved in this case, um, as to whether um, rec removal claims are or are not the subject of limitation uh, in English law. And that, I think, um, brings us to the end of what we wanted to say before we get on to questions. Um, and Ruth is going to uh, take on the onerous responsibility of, of sharing those out. I am, mainly so that I don't have to answer them myself. Um, if you've got questions, either put them in the chat function or the Q&A function, and we've been sent some in advance, so we'll kick off with those to start with. Um, James, um, uh, hopefully this is an easy one given our previous case. Um, can anybody from the Ever Given, or, or in fact any other vessel should this ever happen, bring a claim against a pilot 
if the pilot's negligence has caused the incident? Uh, well, in the case of the Suez Canal, the answer is a definite no, and that's because transit through the Suez Canal is on terms known as the, the rules published by the Suez Canal Authority, and that includes a provision saying, you're not coming after our pilots, thank you very much. Uh, in, at, at English, in English law, the, the general position is no, uh, also after the abolition of the defense of compulsory pilotage um, over 100 years ago, because uh, the master retains the con of the vessel uh, when in pilotage waters. And if the pilot were to give um, advice that was negligent, the expectation is that the master would catch it and correct it and stop it before it was implemented. Uh, or indeed intervene if the pilot was not giving advice that uh, he or she should be giving. So the, the answer to that is, is really no, and it would be a quite extraordinary uh, circumstance uh, in which negligence by a pilot uh, was the effective cause of the casualty. One, one possibility on that, um, of course, is that in the Suez Canal, as we discovered in our collision case, Ruth, uh, and Chirag, um, there is a lot of communication between the pilots on the different ships in, in a convoy, but all of that communication is in Arabic and not necessarily consistently shared with the bridge teams uh, of the vessels that they're piloting. Uh, and it is possible, of course, for uh, an uncommunicated piece of information uh, to bring about a casualty, uh, although um, in our case, it was held not to have done. Um Either Nigel or Shirank, as you dealt with GA, uh, would, a, a, would an excessive demand for salvage security or down payment be viewed as a kidnap and ransom and therefore fall within GA? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, it's extremely difficult to answer that. And uh, it's going to be a difficult case to make, although it can be made, because you have judicial proceedings. And so, uh, as I understand it, the arrest has been implemented and authorized by the Egyptian courts. And there is an appeal that has just been lodged by the UK PNI club against that arrest. Um, depending upon how that appeal goes, uh, it would be difficult, but not certainly not impossible to say that this is some kind of seizure, but you would have to establish that there was a peril that the vessel was not going to be released and whatever payment is required or whatever security is required um, constitutes extraordinary sacrifice or extraordinary expenditure. Uh, and both of those, um, I think, are raise difficult questions. Wouldn't you agree, Nigel? I, I think I would. And, and, and certainly if you had a position where the demand, whatever it may be, was underpinned by local law, uh, in circumstances where that was local law for a, for a port or for a stretch of water that the owner had agreed to, to tra transit. Um, I think, I think it's equating the, the demand as being equivalent to kidnap or ransom might, might be very difficult. Um, can I just come back to James's point, just to sort of reiterate what he said about pilots? I mean, because the other aspect to it is this, that certainly you can get, you know, certainly... It, where you have um, circumstances surrounding, for example, unsafe ports uh, and allegations concerning the pilots, uh, the, the adequacy of the pilots, that, uh, that is certainly a scenario where I have seen claims made against charterers. Um, but but uh, in the context of Agerting, one of the successful defences that we ran to the unsafe port case was that actually the master and the vessel had passage planning was sufficiently inadequate that they hadn't put themselves in a position where they could spot the errors by the pilot and, and the fact that in essence the pilot was seeking to handbrake round a turn round a buoy in the middle of the channel and an extremely strong stream <laughs> was something that they should have been able to foresee uh, and, and therefore the liability ended up resting with the owners on the basis of negligent navigation possibly unseaworthiness. Thank you. I've got two more questions and then I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, the first is a salvage question. So, um, James, I might ask you, uh, and this question does come with a caveat that we know it's subject to local law. So just assume for the moment that you're a, you can understand Egyptian law. Um, 
can you say if you see local common law salvage claim risks from uh, local professional salvors, Egyptian military, Suez Canal authorities, or all three? Um, well, assuming as any English judge would, that Egyptian law is the same as English law. <laughs> <laughs> the the answer is yes. I mean, all of them. Um, but it, it, any that can show that they have contributed to a useful result can claim salvage. So if they owned um, a tug or a digger uh, that was employed in the salvage, um, any of them could claim. Of course, the, diff the, the, the situation would be different if this were in inland waters in the UK, because you can't claim salvage there, see the goring, but that's, that's another story. So, so we wouldn't be applying that bit of English law, at least, in relation to the no, Suez Canal? No, indeed. Um, so the last question is an unsafe port question, so I'm going to come back to Nigel, since he touched on unsafe ports. Um, do you think that the Suez Canal falls within the safety of approach undertaken given by a charterer? Mm. So really I'm, not I'm not sure I'm going to thank you for that one, Rick. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that, well, I mean, the obvious answer to that is it depends on the port of loading and the port of discharge. I mean, the, the Suez Canal per se is, is, in essence, a narrow channel between two stretches of sea. Whether it constitutes the approach for any particular port uh, must be a question of fact on the, on, on the circumstances. But if, for example, you had goods coming from China to Europe, assuming I've got my geography right, um, then I, I would have thought the answer is, is, is no. Um, even if you're looking at delivery on a port just outside the exits, either exit of the Suez Canal, I mean, again, I think it's difficult to say that the whole Suez Canal would be an approach. Um, you know, it could, it, not just because, just, just given its length. I mean, I don't know if anyone disagrees with me, but I think I, I think I, I think I might. There is a decision by um, I think it was Mr. Justice Carr in the nineteen nineties, or it might have been the eighties, where the, the the length of the Missis Mississippi was held to be the approach to the port yeah. um, because it, that was the only way of getting to it. Yeah. But the, the, the critical question is whether it is the only way of getting to it. And, and that, I agree with you, has to be dependent on the facts. I mean, if it's a carriage from Port uh, Suez to Port Said, um, it's pretty clear the only way you're going to go is up the Suez Canal. So, but that would be um, quite different from a, a carriage from Shanghai to Rotterdam. Yeah, I think that the generic answer, therefore, Ruth, is probably if, if you've got that type of question, one side needs James, one side needs me. Um, <laughs> Tash, but, but we, we, as I think both of us have said, it, 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 it's going to be a very much a factual question on any in any particular situation. There's, um, there's one more question that's, well, a few questions have come in, but I think two of them I'm going to deal with separately offline. Uh, the last question that's come in, I think I'm going to direct to Shirag. I, I think it's a concurrent liability type question. Um, the question is this, given the ability of time charters to bring tortious claims for delay against an owner rests on proving negligence, how can this be reconciled with the negligence in navigation defences which owners would otherwise be entitled to rely on? Well, um... Generally, uh, as, as between the time charterer and the owner, the claims will not be in tort, it would be in contract. Um, as you know, under English law, in order to have any claims in tort, you have to have a proprietary of, of possessory interest in particular property that's damaged. Um, and the time charterers would not usually have any such interest, either, obviously not, obviously not on the vessel, but not on cargo either. Um, so assuming, as would often generally be the case, that defences of negligent navigation have been incorporated into the time charter by virtue of an incorporation of, a, uh, of the Hague rules or Hague-Visby rules by a clause paramount, then the owners will have a defence for negligent navigation. And as I'd indicated earlier, really the only route that the charters would have under those circumstances uh, assuming incorporation of the Hague rules, would be to prove unseaworthiness. Um, now, that can either be because of inadequate bridge team management, in, inadequate passage planning, although it is as difficult to see how passage planning could have been causative of what happened here, um, or indeed incompetence of crew. 
But again, as we know from our Suez Canal case, in fact, what happens on these vessels is that the pilots run the show. And there is very limited information that the master has as to what the pilot is going to do next or what the pilot knows or what the pilot has promised he's going to do to other pilots. Because as James pointed out, that's all done in Arabic. Um, so, uh, so the answer is really um, the charters would have to prove uh, unseaworthiness. Although lots of questions are still coming in, I think we're probably up for time. And I know that we're all um, available to go into breakout rooms afterwards. I'm gonna hand over to Nigel to do a little bit uh, on the next steps for today and, and also what's happening next week with the second session. So uh, thank you very much, Ruth. Well, uh, that all that really remains for me to do is to thank uh, all, all of my co-panelists for, 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 for today. Uh, and also to thank everybody who has uh, taken the time out this morning to listen to us. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, uh, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, that is it from us for now. Uh, as, as we've said a couple of times through the session, the net, there is another, there is a, a further quadcast coming up. Uh, that is on the 6th of May at 11 a.m., uh, where Chris Smith QC, uh, the New Silk in Chambers, Nicola Warrender, Queen's Council, uh, Caroline Pounds and Paul Henton, will be discussing third party claims uh, and the wider ramifications from a grounding like that at the Ever Given. And we'll be looking at issues among other things such as uh, delay, deviation, uh, force majeure, frustration, and indeed insurance. So please do sign on for that session. In that case, thank you very much everybody and see you soon. <laughs>